Tainus Esther is, is not mentioned in the Gemara at all. It is not listed as a day that you have to fast. Obviously, in the Megillah itself, the Jewish people fasted for three days, and those three days were actually the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th, uh, and that is when Esther went into Achashverosh, and Haman was killed the next day. Haman was hung on the second day of Pesach, and that first year, that year of fasting, they did not eat matzah on the 15th of Nisan. They were mevatel and mitzvah say the Arisa because they were Yoshev Batinus, and uh, that was considered to be pikuach nefesh, and that's why they didn't uh, do this mitzvah. Uh, people don't realize that a lot of the Purim story happened on Pesach itself. Haman was killed, was hung, on the 16th of Nisan, and that, right, that was the day after Esther went to Achashverosh, there was a party that day, and then there was a party the next day, Haman was revealed. Uh, and that's when he was hung. And uh, that is why some have a minog that they say Shoshanes Yaakov at lunch of the second day of Pesach. And some have a kosher le Pesach such a Such a minog. Uh, so there certainly is a three-day fast in the book of Esther. But in terms of making it a permanent fast, it's not in the Gemara Bechlau. Uh, the first mention of a Tainus Esther is in, from the Ga'inim. So Tainus Esther is a Tainus from this man of the Ga'inim. It is not from the time of the Gemara itself. Now, this raises a very, very interesting problem. Uh, and that is, the earliest book of Tairish Balpeh that was written down, even before the Mishnah, was a book that is called Megillas Tainus, the scroll of Tainus. Now, Megillas Tainus is not, uh, the name is a little misleading. It is not a list of fast days, the other way around. It is a list of festive days that you're not allowed to fast or eulogize because they were happy days. And one of the days that are listed in Megillah's Tainus as a day that you're not allowed to fast is the 13th of Adar. The 13th of Adar, today, you're not allowed to fast. That is what Megillah's Tainus says. Why aren't you allowed to fast? Nothing to do with Purim at all. Nothing to do with Purim. The 13th of Adar is a holiday that was called Yom Nikanar, Nikanar's Day. Who is Nikanar? Nikanar was a general of Antiochus, Hanukkah story. And Nikanar, in one of the battles of the Chashmonayim, Nikanar had gathered a great, great army to besiege Jerusalem. And miraculously, his army was defeated and he had to retreat. And in memory of the great Nitzachon, or, well, it wasn't a victory because we didn't fight him, but the, the fact that this great threat against Yerushalayim was averted, Chazal were Masakain, that Yom Niknar is a Yom Tif, and you're not allowed to fast. So something's not computing here. Uh, today is the 13th of Adar. Today is Yom Niknar, and we have a fast called the Fast of Esther. How can we have a fast of Esther if Chazal were already Masakain that today is Yom Niknar? And, and again, the fast of Esther came way after Megillah's Tainus. Megillah's Tainus is before the Mishnah. Tainus Esther is after the Gemara, it's the time of the Gaonim, right? So something a little strange. So one answer would be this. One answer would be that in, in the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah discusses whether Batla Megillah's Tainus or Lai Batla Megillah's Tainus. That means Megillah's Tainus gives you many, many days, most of which we don't keep at all, that are festive days. Many of them involve the Hanukkah story. Many of them involve various victories of the Chashmonayim. And Batla Megillah's Tainus means that Megillah's Tainus ceases to be binding after the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. And once the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, uh, and we're back to suffering, we're back to Golas, we no longer commemorate all of those victories in Megillas Tainus. That's the Mandi Amri that says Butla Megillas Tainus. So if you hold Butla Megillas Tainus, you have a very simple answer. Ein Achinami, during the Second Temple, they didn't keep Tainus Esther. Anyway, the, the fast wasn't Miyazid. 
right? During the second temple, the 13th of Adar was Yom Niknor, and it was a Yom Tif based on its status in Megillah Tainus. After the Chorban, Botla Megillah Tainus. If Megillah Tainus is Botel, then the holiday of Niknor is no longer a holiday. Mimela, the Ga'inim, could then make it a day of fast to commemorate the events in the Megillah. So if you hold Butla Megillah's Tainus, the fact that Yom Niknor, which was a day you're not allowed to fast, became a day that you're chayiv to fast, is not so difficult because the holidays of Megillah's Tainus became nullified. The problem is, there is another Mandi Amar that says Loi Butla Megillah Tainus, that Megillah's Tainus holidays continue to remain in effect. If that's the case, well, Mazel Tov, today is Yom Niknar. If today is Yom Niknar, how could there be Tainus Esther? So La Halacha, it's not a problem. La Halacha, we pass in Botla, Megillah's Tainus. So that's not a problem. But how would the other Mandi Amar understand the permissibility of Tainus Esther? And I think the only answer I can think of is he wouldn't. According to that Mandi Amar, there would not have been a Tainus Esther. You would not have been allowed to enact a Tainus Esther. And the heter of enacting Tainus Esther is only because we paskin like the Mandi Amar, Batla Megillus Tainus. Like the one that says, Loi Batla, you would not have Tainus Esther at all. Okay, so it's an interesting Chiddush that the fact that we have Tainus Esther is a raya that we paskin like the halacha of Butla Megillus Tainus. Now anyway, you know that we paskin that way because if you go through Megillus Tainus, you will see a whole bunch of festive days that we don't celebrate. So it, it's, it's muchrech that we follow the Mandi Amar, Butla Megillus Tainus, yeah. Is Megillah Tainit, is that we're saying that those days should be days of like, of like Simcha or is it just that you can't fast on those days? Well, it doesn't say you have to affirmatively celebrate. It says you're not allowed to fast or eulogize, Hespit. It doesn't say uh, you have to make a yamtif, but the reason was because these were festive days, yeah. Does this mean that we're not allowed to celebrate those days, or is it just that we... Oh, no, you are, you know, you are allowed to say a butler just means they no longer become obligatory, so therefore you're allowed to fast or eulogize a mace. There is no iser in, in celebrating. And again, uh, Megillus Tainus uh, is a, well, it's called a brysa. It's earlier than the Mishnah, but it's a brysa because it's from the Tanoim outside of the Mishnah, right? Brysa means outside. Any teaching of a Tana that is not in the Mishnah is called a brysa, whether it's earlier than the Mishnah or whether it's after the Mishnah. That, now, the issue of before or after is not important in that designation. Um, the Gemara in Maseches Tainus often quotes passages from Megillus Tainus, but you can actually get it as a separate book, a safer called Megillus Tainus with Meforshim and, and the like that give you the whole Megillus Tainus. There's a total of like, um, it's more than 30, I don't remember the exact number if it's 34 or 35, but uh, certainly more than 30 designated days, which would have been Yomim Tovim during the bias. Shani. In fact, some Gedalia, interestingly enough, uh, that's not our sugi right now, the third of Tishrei is a holiday under Megillus Tainus. Uh, because a, a little bit of a strange story. Uh, the third of Tishrei, they stopped using Hashem's name in Shtaris, business documents. Uh, because the problem was they're using Hashem's name, but then people would rip up the document and Hashem's name would be thrown to be Zion. So when they stopped using Hashem's name, it was happened to be the third of Tishrei. I'm not sure exactly how they measure when they stopped. I mean, how can you point to a particular day? But that's when the Chazal said, Abrach Hashem, no one is using Hashem's name in a star. They made the third of Tishrei a Simcha day where you're not allowed to fast. That's the day that we have some Gedalia. All right, so that'll leave for maybe when we get to some Gedalia, which Hashem will... We'll talk about that one. But the two, just, just keep in mind, that the two anomalous days that are festivals in Miguel Astinas and that are fast days in our calendar are the 3rd of Tishrei and the 13th of Adar. Right? The 3rd of Tishrei, which we observe as Som Gedalia. The 13th of Adar, that we observe as Tainus Esther, were actually festive days in the time of the second Beis HaMikdash. Yeah. Once is it batal, is it batal again? Like forever, or, saying, or once we have a Beit HaMikdash, would it be 
No, our assumption is when we have a base of mikdash, it'll come back. It'll come back. But uh, right now, because of the sorrows, they said, you know, why are you celebrating all of these festive days? They were mainly temporary victories. Okay. Uh, actually, the only exception is it says all of Megillus Tainus is bato except for Hanukkah and Purim. That's Hanukkah and Purim. Hanukkah and Purim are also in Megillus Tainus. And those are the two days of Megillus Tainus that still remain Yamim Tovim for Klal Yisrael. Uh, in fact, it's interesting. This is a very non-mystical interpretation of a famous, famous Gemara, uh, Gemara that everybody's heard. I'm sorry, a famous Medrash. All the Moadim are nullified except for Purim and some are Goris Hanukkah and Purim. So everybody understands that that means when Mashiach comes, all the Yomim Tovim are going to go away and the only one we're going to keep is Hanukkah or Purim, Hanukkah and Purim. And then you'll get all sorts of drushes that Purim is so important that it's going to be the only holiday that survives after Mashiach comes. And reams and reams of Sifri Hasidus and Kabbalah go into this. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, the Pashat Pshat is a very undramatic, it'll be a very disappointing Pshat, it'll be a very dry Pshat. Sorry, uh, when it says, all the Moedim are batal, it is not referring to Mashiach. It's referring to Megillah's Tainus. And Moedim does not mean Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot are going to be nullified. But it means all the special holidays of Megillah's Tainus are not going to be observed after the Chorban except for Hanukkah and Purim. So it's not referring to Mashiach, and it doesn't mean there's not going to be Pesach when Mashiach comes. I mean, that contradicts the Rambam's Zikr that the mitzvahs are gonna, not going to be annulled. It just means Butla, butla Megillus Tainus. I, I know it's a disappointing pshat, you know, you're not going to you know, say it at a Purim Suda as something <laughs> inspiring, but it just in terms of Pashat Pshat, Kala Mayadam Betelim is referring to the Butla Megillus Tainus. Okay, so... Let's now go back to Tiny Esther. So now, because we don't have Megillah's Tainus, we're simply keeping Tiny Esther. Why did the Ga'inim create the Minog of Tiny Esther? What is it commemorating? So the simple pshat, which I think all of you would probably answer, and it's a simple pshat, is it's a commemoration of the three days that Esther Hamalka had Klal Yisrael fast. Now, granted, that was three days. Our fast is one day. Okay, but that, that you can understand. The Chachamim didn't want to create a three-day fast. That would be a little difficult. So they did it one day. But it's a zecher to the Gimel Yamim. Now, what's interesting is, Esther's fast, however, was in the month of Nisan. 13th, 14th, 15th. And Purim was a year later, 11 months later. So if our fast is a commemoration of the fast of Esther, then why don't we do it in Nisan? Why do we do it before Purim? And uh, the short answer is because generally speaking, we try not to fast in the month of Nisan. The month of Nisan is a month uh, of Geula, the month of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Tainas Bechayrim is, is one exception, but that's limited to the firstborn, but we don't want to have a general fast. For example, uh, if when you're planning your wedding, you may want to think about uh, making the wedding in Nisan uh, because that way uh, the chasna and the kala do not have to fast uh, in the month of Nisan, right, etc. So that's a simple answer. Okay, but the MS is like this. The MS is, we have another interesting Masechus, which is called Masechus Ketanos. If, you, um, if you've come across this, I think I've talked about it before also. If you look... This just happens to be where it's printed. There's no significance in, in where it's printed. But if you look at, at the end of Masecha Savodizara, take a regular shas. And after Masecha Savodizara, you'll see a lot of things. You'll see Horias, which is in fact a regular Masecha of Gemara. You'll see Pirkei Avos, okay, which is a tractate of Mishnah. Okay, that's Mishnah Gemara. But then you'll see a whole bunch of stuff that may be a little unfamiliar. You'll see something called Avos de Rabbi Nason. You will see Maseches Sofrim. You will see Maseches Simachos. You will see Maseches Geirim. Maseches Sitzes. Maseches Tfilin. Maseches Sefer Torah. And the word Maseches appears there, 
But it doesn't look like a regular Masechus. You don't have like Mishnah, Gemara, Rashi, Tosos. And these are not regular Masechtos of Shas. These go by the name Masechtos Kitanos. The small Masechtos. There are seven of them altogether. Now what are the Masechtos Kitanos? So the Masechtos Kitanos were compiled in the time of the Gaonim. And what they do is they do gather together Mamorim of Tanorim and Amoram. So a lot of the things in Maseches Sofrim can be traced to Maseches Megillah, Maseches Shabbos, etc. But it just, uh, in fact, some suggested, we're not really clear, like, why, why were these even written? Some suggested this was an early attempt by the Gainim, the earliest Gainim, to codify the halachas that come out of the Gemara without Shaklavataria. So Masechah Seifrim gathers together all of the Mamarim about writing Taira, Tefillin, and Mezuzah and Kriyas Torah and puts them together without a long Shakla Vitaria. Masechah Smachos is the laws of Avelas. Smachos is a euphemism. Smachos means happy occasions. It's the laws of Avelas. So the Gainim didn't complete the whole process. They didn't do a Masechah Shabbos that way. But it was an early attempt to gather things together. So most of the Masechtas Kitanos are quotations from Tanoim and Amoraim, with some additions from the Gainim. Most can be found in the Bavli or the Yushalmi. But occasionally there are Mamorim from Tanoim and Amoraim that cannot be traced to the Bavli or the Yushalmi. It might actually be some original material of the Tanoim. Now, one of the great things about Masechus Sofrim, which deals with a lot of things, it deals with the writing of Tefillin, Torah Mezuzah, and it deals with Kriya Satayra, and it deals with many Minhagim about fast days and the like, is that Masechus Sofrim records ancient Minhagim of Eretz Yisrael that became totally bato. It became totally bato that they're not even mentioned in the Talmud Bavli. Maybe in the Yerushalmi, and maybe not even in the Yerushalmi. In other words, the Gainim of Bato were mevato the Minagim. So Masecha Seifrim, besides being a source of halacha, is also an archaeological source of halacha because it brings to light Minagim that you would never have heard of at all. You could be a Bucky in Shas. You could know Shas by art. And you would not be aware of some Minhagim that are recorded in Masech Sofrim because they're literally extinct. And here is one minig of Masech Sofrim that nobody follows today and nobody has followed maybe for a thousand years. And that is, it is recorded in Masech Sofrim that people used to fast the Monday, Thursday, Monday after, after Purim. Uh, now, quite amazing. That, so number one, it doesn't call it Tainus Esther, but it's referring to Tainus Esther. The fast of Esther was after Purim, not before. And it was three days, not one day. But it was not three consecutive days. It was uh, Monday, Thursday, Monday. What's going on? So here is what this old Minog was doing. The old Minog says, well, if we want to commemorate Esther's fast day, it ought to be three days. But three consecutive days is too hard, so we'll make it Monday, Thursday, Monday, which anyway are days of Shuva and the like. And logically, it should be before Purim. But we, want to, we don't want to do it before Purim because the, the month of Adar before Purim is still the Zman of Simcha. And we don't want to do it in Nisan because Nisan is a Zman of Simcha. So Mimela, we do Tainus Esther after Purim. So look at this. Three days after Purim, Monday, Thursday, Monday, was at least, I don't know if it was the original way, but it was one of the old ways that Tainus Esther was observed. Now, Tainus Esther Bichlal is not mentioned in the Bavli, even as a one-day fast. 
But Masechah Sofrim does record it as a three-day fast that occurred after Purim. So this is an example where if you didn't learn Masechah Sofrim, you know, you could know Bavli and Yerushalmi, you would not be aware of such a Mitzvah. Mamish, uh, a totally new minog. Well, it's an old minog, but a, a minog that is totally lost from Am Yisrael. Yeah. Yeah, now that, 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 that's a possibility as well, as well, because um, although the Minag of Bahav, as we practice it, does not encompass Purim, although it's a good kasha, why? Uh, among Ashkenazim, Sephardim don't really have Bahav. Uh, the Monday, Thursday, Monday, after the Shalosh Regalim, were originally days of fasting, and uh, most people don't fast today. Some people say Selichos, uh, the minig of the center is, we don't say Selichos, the minig of the base Medrash is, they do say Selichos. Well, maybe an advantage if you want to thinking about moving to the base Medrash. Okay, um, so wh what is Bahav about? So you're correct. Bahav is about the idea that during the Shalosh Regalim, people might have gotten too excited, too happy, too drunk. Kalos Reish. And Mimela. Monday, Thursday, Monday are days of tshuva. So one has a kapara for the kalos reish. Now it's a little tricky because the Bahav of Pesach waits until Eeyore because you don't want to fast during Nisan. So the Bahav of Pesach is two weeks after Pesach or at least a week after Pesach. Rosh Chodesh Eeyore. And similarly, the Bahav of Sukkot will wait until Cheshvan. It's only the Bahag of Shavuos that's right away. So the Bahag is not right away, but it's based on that. So one could ask a very good kasha. If the Minag of Bahav is Gabite, is built on Kapara for Kalis Reish, why isn't there a Bahav for, Sukha, for, for Purim? I mean, it, it would appear that the risk of Kalis Reish is much, much greater for Purim than it would be for Pesach. That's a good kasha. So you want to suggest that maybe Masechah Seifrim has this three-day fast, not because of Tainus Esther, but because there was a type of Bahav ritual for Purim. Uh, that's very, very interesting pshat. Uh, but even if that's right, it's still a minog that's not followed at all. So Mimanavshach, no matter how you interpret the minog, is a tremendous chiddish uh, of a minog that has become extinct in, in Klal uh, Yisrael. In fact, I'm trying to remember, I don't think Masecha Seifrim even mentions Bahav for Pesach Shvuas Sukkot. But it does mention it for Purim, but maybe that's because the Kalos Reish was greater, or maybe because that's a Zecher for the three-day fast of, of Esther. Right? So this is Masecha Seifrim. Uh, it's Kedai to, uh, when you take, just take out a Masecha Zavodah look in the back and you'll see all of these Masechtos Kitanos. Very, very interesting and as I say, we don't really have a clear understanding. They are not part, for example, they're not part of Shas, meaning in a Dafyomi Shir, uh, cycle, they do not do the Masechtas Kitanis. I think Rav Chaim Kineski does. Um, of course, he finishes everything, but, but he actually says that he considers Masechtas Kitanos as part of the Siam of Shas. But he says, uh, he kind of had the attitude. No, it's printed in the Gemara, so it's part of Shah. You know, uh, what's every, he'll do what's ever there, right? <laughs> so, I mean, he'll finish it one way. He'll finish it one way or the other. So whether he calls it Shas or he just finishes. In fact, he's written some Mephorshim on it. There are not that many Mephorshim on Masechtas Katanos. And he's written, he himself has written Mephorshim. Uh, not all of them. Uh, he did not write on Masechtas Seifrim, but on many of the... Masechtas Seifrim is a big, small Masechtas. Masechtas Seifrim is like 35 Prakim. Most of the Masechtas Katanas are like five Prakim. So he's written on the small Masechtas Katanas. He did not yet write on the big Masechtas Katanas. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, but be it as it may, the Pashtus of Tainus Esther is, it's a Zecher to the three days of Esther's fast, but we do it in Adar instead of Nisan, and we do it uh, one day instead of three days. That's the Pashtus. However, there's actually a Makor in the Talmud Yerushalmi that suggests that what we call Tainus Esther has nothing to do with Esther's fast at all. In fact, maybe it shouldn't even be called Tainus Esther. It is an unrecorded fast 
of the Jewish people on the 13th of Adar that's not even recorded. And what is that? The 13th of Adar was a very, very dangerous day for Kuala Israel. Let's remember, let's remember what happened that year. Haman decreed, with Achashverosh's approval, that on the 13th of Adar, the Jewish people were open hunting, meaning anybody who wanted to kill a Jew could kill a Jew with impunity. There would be no prosecution. There would be no punishment. The 13th of Adar, that is the day that Klal Yisrael was in Sakana. And even when Achashverosh sent out a second decree, you'll recall that because Persia had this crazy rule that a king could never repeal. He was so perfect, so infallible, that he could not repeal his own law, because after all, he was perfect. So what does the king do to save the Jews? He doesn't simply say to the Goyim, you can't kill Jews anymore. He can't take that away. But he says, you have the right to defend yourself. So it turned out that we were still fighting, meaning even after this, every guy that wanted to kill us had the right to do so. And we were waging Mohama. Presumably we were outnumbered. There were many more non-Jews than Jews. But miraculously, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a tremendous Nitzachet. But the 13th of Adar was a day of Sakana Atsuma. Sakana Atsuma. It's pointed out that we don't celebrate Purim on the day of our victory, we celebrate Purim on the day that is a peaceful day. Because we don't glorify in killing the enemy. We glorify in the shalom that is brought to the world when evil is taken away. Right? A lot of people might celebrate, a lot of cultures might celebrate the day of our great victory over our enemies, which was the 13th of Adar. Right? But Purim, again, Yerushalayim is different because Yerushalayim is the status of Shushan, but let's say the rest of the world where Purim is the 14th is not the day of military victory. It's the day of the peace following the victory. Now, it is recorded in the Yerushalmi that it was the minag of Jewish soldiers the day they would go to war, they would fast, asking Hashem for salvation. Now this is an unusual behavior. You'd figure the day that you're going to war, you want to have a good breakfast. Number one, in a macabre way, it might be your last meal. But more realistically, you know, you need energy, you need strength. And you don't want to be weak when you have to fight an enemy. But the Jewish soldier understood that their needs sachan over their enemy is not going to be a function of their physical vim and vigor. But it'll be the siyata deshmaya that they get because of tshuva. And therefore, the Jewish soldiers would fast the day they would go into battle. And since the day they went into battle was the 13th of Adar, that is why we have Tainus Esther. So which is very interesting. So it's not a commemoration of Esther's fast in Nisan, it is a commemoration of the undocumented fast of the Chayolim who were fighting the enemy on the 13th. And that, of course, explains the, the dates. Bediok is the 13th of Adar because that was the day that the Jewish armies fasted. The only question is, according to that, would it be called Tainus Esther? Why would it be called Tainus Esther? Esther had nothing to do with that fast. Esther created the three-day fast. Right? But the fast of the soldiers was something they did anyway. So that's a little bit of a tzorichian, according to that pshat. Why would it be called Tainus Esther? See? Yeah. Maybe it's Tainus Megillus Esther? Megillus Esther, okay, maybe. But perhaps, perhaps. Doesn't mean the Tainus that Esther made, but the Tainus connected to the story of Esther or the Megillus Esther. That, that's, that's a possibility. It could also be, another possibility is, that maybe Esther set the precedent. Maybe this idea that soldiers fasted was a result of her three-day fast resulted in Achashverosh issuing a more favorable decree. So they saw that fasting worked. Uh, so Mamela, they adapted it when they went out to war. So it could be Esther gets credit for that second, because that was after, right? That was 11 months after Esther's fast. Uh, but wouldn't you 
wouldn't there be precedent with uh, Shaul declaring a, a fast that Yonah's son broke? Um, that's a good point, but th that, that is a little different because that seems to have been a fast that was decreed like uh, in the middle of the war, meaning we're pursuing the enemy, we don't want to stop. In other words, it wasn't a fast in anticipation of war. It was, we're routing the enemy, we're not supposed to stop for anything. So it may have, may have had a different, it may have had a different function. Uh, yeah. Um, a lot of fasts we fast are meant to Tisha B'Av, and I'm saying it's the only, I'm correcting the core book. Yeah. And Tisha B'Av is the only one that's not. So what, yeah. what, re what relevance, like all these events happen, yeah. So here, yeah, so let, let me point out a very interesting thing. Um, all of us know that when the ninth of Av falls out on Shabbos, so we don't fast on Shabbos, so we observe Tisha B'Av Saturday night and Sunday. We fast on the tenth of Av. Uh, if you remember, if you've ever experienced this, so Mose Shabbos, we only make a bracha on the candle. We don't make havdalah because we can't drink. We say baruch and we said it in Shimon Esrei so we can do malacha. And then when Tisha B'Av is over, we make a regular havdalah uh, without a candle because you already made the bracha, Motzei Shabbos. Uh, whether you make it on wine, grape juice, beer, that depends on the minhagim of carrying it over to the tenth of Av. That's a separate issue. Uh, but the point is we don't uh, fast on Shabbos we push the fast to Sunday. Now, what happens when Tainus Esther falls out on Shabbos? Let's imagine that Purim is on Sunday. Purim can be on Sunday. Even his regular Purim can be on Sunday. Regular Purim cannot be on Shabbos, although uh, Tesvav can be on Shabbos, but uh, regular Purim can be on Sunday, Mosei Shabbos, Sunday. So Tainus Esther is Shabbos. So when do you fast Tainus Esther when Yun Gimel uh, Adar is on Shabbos? So you fast on Thursday. You don't fast on Shabbos because it's Shabbos. You don't fast on Friday because we normally want to avoid, there are, Asar Batavis is one exception, but we normally want to avoid fasting on Friday because we don't want you to enter Shabbos kind of uh, in a state of deprivation. So we fast on Thursday. Megillah will be read on Sunday, Yerushalayim Monday, but Sunday, Tainus Esther is Thursday. So, simple question. How come when Tisha B'Av is on Shabbos, we fast on Sunday, we make it later, when Tainus Esther is on Shabbos, which it could be, we make it earlier, two days earlier. Right? It's a kasha. In fact, all other fa well, well, Yom Kippur is of course different. Yom Kippur, even if it's on Shabbos, you fast. So Yom Kippur is bichlau different. But whether it's Tisha B'av, Shivas or Batamas, Asara B'teves, which actually cannot fall out on Shabbos, but okay, so so well, okay, so Tzom Gedalia, Tisha B'av, and Shivas or Batamas. If they fall out on Shabbos, you push it off. Right? Why is Tainus Esther mocked him? So the Shem Shmuel says a very, very nice answer. The Gemara in Megillah says, why do we delay Tisha B'av? When Tisha B'av falls out on Shabbos, why are we ma'acher rather than mocked him? Reason? Akdume poranusa lo makdaminan. We don't want to bring on tragedies or catastrophes earlier than we have to. Tisha B'Av is a fast that commemorates tragedy after tragedy. The tragedy of the Chet HaMaraglim, the tragedy of the Chorban Bayis Rishain, the Chorban Bayis Sheni, the destruction of Betar, the plowing of Yerushalayim with salt, which destroyed the fertility of the land. And other tragedies, whether it be uh, the Spanish Inquisition, whether it be uh, World War I, wh whatever, whatever it is. It's Paranius. It's a day of grief, a day of sadness, a day of mourning. You don't bring it on earlier. You try to push it off as long as you can. 
because we're supposed to be besimcha. So Mamela, if it falls out on Shabbos, push it off. And the same is true for all of the fast days connected to the Chorben Beis HaMikdash. Som Gedalia, uh, Shiva Sarbatamas, connected to the Chorben Beis HaMikdash. Akdume Paranusa Lo Makdamine. Now, Tainus Esther. Is Tainus Esther a fast about something bad that happened? Actually not. Tainus Esther is a Tainus that worked. We were facing death and destruction. We fasted, whether it's Esther's fast of three days or whether it's the Chayolim on the 13th, that makes no difference. And what does Tainus Esther teach us? That when we turn to Hashem with tefillah, with tshuva, with sincerity, He answers our prayers. He gives us the issue. It's not about Peronius at all. It is a fast that is actually a joyous occasion. Mimela, the Shem Shmuel says, what's the problem with doing it early? The problem with Tisha B'Av is Akdume Peronusa Lomak Demina. This is not Peronius. There's no Peronius in the fast of Esther. There is only Bracha. So seen in this way, the fast of Esther is actually a precursor to the joy of Purim. It's part of the joy of Purim. I'm fasting, but I'm not heartbroken. I'm not sabrochen. Rather, I have this beautiful feeling that if I am in sincere in turning to Hashem, I can hope for His salvation, for His Yeshua, for His Siyat HaDishmaya. So the Shem Shmuel says, there's no problem with doing this one early. This is a fast of Simcha. Okay, interesting point. Part of it. So people say, like, am I supposed to be sad? You know, uh, so Tisha B'Av, you know, the answer is more or less yes. Now, you're not sad because you're hungry. It's the other way around. You're hungry because you're sad, meaning I'm not eating because I'm sad. Not that I'm sad that I'm not eating. <laughs> okay, that's Tisha B'Av. I'm supposed to be heartbroken over the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. But what am I supposed to be heartbroken on? Now, now again, I mean, Lamaisa, there are reasons to be heartbroken, things that are happening in the world that we should think about on a fast day. What is going on in Ukraine and the suffering of the Jews there, well, not, and not just the Jews, really everybody. And so I'm not saying that there's no makom to be heartbroken over the things that are happening in the world, but the events of Tainus Esther are nothing to be heartbroken about. That is cool, though, Simcha. And that's why there's no problem in being mocked him. It's really a very interesting way of thinking. So, Tainus Esther, going back to your question, Tainus Esther is not about commemorating something. It's about reinforcing the idea that when Klal Yisrael does tshuva and turns to Hashem sincerely, HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings the Yeshua. So it's a very different fast day than, than any of the other fast days. Yeah? So why do we have slichos on, on this day? So why do we have slichos? So, so this is a good point. I, uh, let's, I mean, one should examine the idea of, of slichos. So the reason we have slichos is because, once again, the reminder is when we do tshuva and turn to Hashem, He will... Uh, gr grant us rachamim. So we have to do tshuva and turn to Hashem. So slichos is the part of the uh, day where we're doing the tshuva. But if you look at the slichos of Tainus Esther, you will actually see that it does have um, a triumphal, optimistic tone. It says, you saved us, and you know, etc. So, so it is a little different than the slichos, or the, certainly the kinos, well, that we say on, on, on Tisha B'Av, right? So it's good to look at the words. In fact, if uh, this, is a, this is a good Eitzah generally, um, we don't pay that much attention to it. If you really want to get a sense of what is the Ruach of a Yom Tif, or what is the Ruach of a day, so sometimes you can, you can examine the special tefillahs of the day, the kinos of Tisha B'Av, which, which are very hard to examine, the slichos of the fast days, like what are the themes? Uh, during the Shalosh Regalim, we have piyutim that nobody's, almost nobody says today, but they're in Machzorim, Yotzros and piyutim. Uh, many of them were written by very great people, Rabbi Elazar Kalir, who wrote the Kinos and the Yom Naran piyutim, but there are also, also piyutim for Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkot. And if you ever have a chance to go through some of them, they are very, very hard. You get a sense of, you know, what are the 
ideas that I, I should be thinking about uh, during the Yom Yom Tovim. So it's a whole unexplored uh, uh, kind of gold mine of different ideas that, again, most people never get to. Uh, the last vestige who says all of these piyut, and these are Ashkenazic piyut, Sephardim have different ones. Sephardim are are very, very rich in that. But for the Ashkenazic piyut, the last group that says them are the Yekis. The Yekis, uh, you know, if it's in the Siddur, they say it. If the Siddur is like one to a thousand, you know, uh, they're going to say a thousand pages on, on, on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, most of us uh, skip a lot. Uh, and although there is a justification for skipping, because it's better to say less with Kavana than to say more and more and more and more and more without Kavana. So that's true, that is a cheshpen. But it also means there are, there are things that you are missing. And unfortunately, a lot of the pieces were not even translated by art scroll. If you look at an art scroll machzer, uh, so, at the end, you know, so they translate a lot. And then at the end of the machzer, they'll have like maybe 50 pages and they'll say, uh, these are recited by very few congregations. And they just give you the text. And there's no, no translation at all. So a lot of Piyutim, even Art Scroll, does not uh, translate because so few shuls say it. We skip even the parts that Art Scroll does translate. But then there's something beyond that, that, you know, say, if Art Scroll doesn't translate it, then you know, it must be that nobody really is saying it. But the Yekis say it. The Yekis still, still say it. That's why, uh, you know, a... In fact, Rav Shrab used to complain. <laughs> you know, uh, the minag of Ashkenazim is on Erev Rosh Hashanah, we have very long slichas. Erev Yom Kippur, we have very short slichas. Uh, the Yekis have very long slichas on Erev Yom Kippur. So Rav Shrab used to complain about uh, all the people that daven in his show during the year, but Erev Yom Kippur, they're, they're davening somewhere else. You know, he said, oh, you know, if you're if you signed up, you know, you got to sign up for, for the, whole, the whole plan. Okay. All righty. So that's uh, some thoughts on, on Tainus Esther. Um, now, what's our schedule? Uh, th there's a schmooze when? Are we chiller? Sure Am I supposed to go till one? And nobody told me. Should I keep you till one? I don't want to. All right. I don't want to pu punish anybody. Okay. Uh, if you have to leave, feel free to leave. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk until close to the schmooze, maybe five, five to one or whatever. Okay. So let's talk about another aspect of Purim and Amalek, uh, and that is when Mordechai was in doubt uh, whether Hashem would save us. So one of the ways he wanted to get a message, uh, what was Hashem's message, was he would stop a child and say, what Pasuk did you learn today? The idea would be that Hashem would cause the child to become like a Navi who would communicate a message from Hashem. So he stopped child number one and he said, what did you learn? So the child, these are going to be the three psukim at the end of Olenu. Al tira mi pachat pisam. Do not be afraid of a sudden fear. Umishayas rishayim. And from the destruction of the evildoers, ki savo, that it will come on them. That sounds good. Baruch Hashem. But he wanted a chazaka. He wanted a pattern. Because otherwise it could be a fluke, a coincidence. So he stops child number two. Apparently, these were different classes learning different psukim. And child number two said, and this is actually a Purim song, Utsu Eitsa Visufar, Dabru Dabru Velo Yokum. They make conspiracies. Utsu Eitsa Visufar, it'll be annulled. Dabru Dabru Velo Yokum, they speak words and it shall not come to pass. Ki Imanu Kale, because Hashem is with us. Wow, sounds good. But Chazaka is three times, not just twice. So he stops the third kid. And the third kid gives him, again, these are the verses after Olenu, different parts of Nach. It says, Ad zikna nihu, I am old and ancient. Hashem is saying, I've been around a long time. V'yani esa v'yamalet, and I will carry you, and I will save you. So Mordechai was now batuach, from three psukim that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending them a message of emuna bitochen. Have faith that Hashem has listened to your tefillahs. Right, this is, this is a Gemara in Megillah. The Vilna Gaon says, a very interesting pshat. The Vilna Gaon says that these three psukim correspond to the three encounters 
we had with Amalek attacking us. There are three encounters in Nach, Tanach, including the Torah, where Amalek attacked us. The first time was right after we left Mitzrayim. Right? The whole world was afraid of us. We were like a boiling bath. Don't mess with the Jews. You'd see us Mitzrayim, the ten plagues, we ask Yamsuf. Amalek jumped into the bath. They got burnt. But they removed. That's what it means, Asher Karcha. They made you cold. I jump into a hot bath, I get burnt. But the water is now cooler for the next guy. Amalek showed you can attack Chloe Israel. Yeah, we lost, but we attacked them. You can do the same thing. Maybe you'll win. They took away the aura of invincibility. That was the first nation that attacked us. That's the first encounter with Amalek. So the Gras says, that's called pachad pisum, a sudden fear. Sudden means unexpected. Nobody expected that Amalek would attack us. So Al-Tira is what Hashem is doing. Remember the first encounter with Amalek, which was a pachad pitom that I saved you from. What is the second encounter of Amalek? This is actually not recorded explicitly. This is 40 years later. When Aaron HaKohen dies, the 40th year, and by the way, this is the only Yortzeit in the Chumash. We know exactly the day that Aaron died from the Chumash itself. He died Rosh Chodesh Av. We know that Moshe died Zion Adar, but that's only by Torah Shabal Peh. The Torah Shabal does not give us the date of Moshe's death, Miriam's death, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov. David, Shlomo, we, from Torah, from the Psukim, we do not know the day of anybody's death. I believe Aaron Cohen is the only person whose yard site is explicitly recorded in the Chumash. What happened when Aaron died? The Anone HaKavayit dispersed. We now became exposed. So the Chumash says we were attacked by Canaanites, and Moshe prayed, and we were able to destroy them. So it, doesn't, it does not say Amalek. It does not say Amalek. But Rashi supplies some missing information. Rashi says, we were not attacked by Canaanites. We were attacked by Amalekites. But Amalek knew that they lost the last time they fought us because of Moshe's prayer. So they figured they would disguise themselves as Canaanim, so that Moshe would pray, please save us from the Canaanim. And that prayer wouldn't work against them because they're Amalekim. So there were Amalekim who disguised themselves as Canaanim in the erroneous thinking that they could defeat the Kayach of Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah. Moshe Rabbeinu suspected, he didn't know, that this might have been a masquerade. And that's why he prayed, Hashem, Deliver this nation to my hands. He didn't pray for Amalek. He didn't pray for Canaan. Whoever these guys are, deliver it. So it turns out that the first attack of Amalek was sudden and unexpected. Pachad Pitom. The second attack of Amalek was masquerade and subterfuge. That's called Eitza, a plan. What does the second Pesach say? Utsu Eitza. They engage in plans. This so far. Okay? Pachat Pitom is the first attack of Amalek. Eitza Visufar is the second attack of Amalek. Now, the third attack of Amalek is Purim itself. Haman is called Haman Agagi. Agag was the king of Amalek that Shaul was supposed to kill and didn't. And even though Shmuel finished him off, in that brief amount of time, Agag impregnated a woman who had a child who was the ancestor of Haman. I'm sorry, the ancestor of Haman. And that's why he's called Haman from Agag. And Mordechai and Esther, the descendants of Shaul, finish off the job 
that Shaul failed to do. That's why it's so important that Mordechai and Esther come from Shaul. Haman Hagagi. By the way, why are we only counting three? What about why don't why don't we count the war of Shaul against Amalek? as an encounter with Amalek? The answer is because that was not Amalekite aggression. In that situation, we were commanded to go after them. But if we talk about the cases when Amalek went after us, there are three. Uh, right after we left Mitzrayim, the 40th year when Aaron died, and Haman Hagagi. These are the three aggressions of Amalek that are recorded in Tanakh. So it is said, that when Haman wanted to eradicate Am Yisrael, some of his advisors said, you know, you really can't do this. The God of Israel is very powerful and he protects his people. There was Mitzrayim and there was Makos. And, and Haman said, God is old. He's retired. He did all of that stuff a long time ago. What he can do then is not what he can do now. His strength is weak. So what does the third Pasuk say? I may be old. I may have been around a long time, but I can still rescue. <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not out, of the, uh, out of the game yet. And I will never be. So the Vilna Gaon says very beautifully that Mordechai is getting all of these assurances. Hashem is saying, remember the first encounter with Amalek. And remember the second encounter with Amalek. And just as I rescued you from those two encounters, I will rescue you from this encounter. That, that's the thematic unity of the three verses. This is the Vilna Gaon's interpretation of why these three psukim, all of which, all of whom are from the Navi Yeshayo, why these three psukim are so important. Okay. So I, what I want to do is I want to add a little bit to the Vilna Gaon. And they want to say, I think we've talked about this, that the mitzvah of eradicating Amalek we're, we're largely not able to do today because I don't know who Amalek is, so I can't go out and kill somebody because I think maybe he's Amalek. Because if he's not, you know, you're over on a very serious Avera. So, Lamaisa, we do not actively fulfill eradicating. We remember Amalek, but we don't fulfill eradicating Amalek today. But, I think I told you from Rav Sadok that there is an aspect of eradicating Amalek that we're supposed to do even today, and that is eradicate within us the negative midos that make us vulnerable to Amalek. Because Amalek outside of us gets its power only from the Amalek within us. And the more we can destroy the Amalek within, the less the Amalek outside will have power. They kind of just vanish. So the two pigamim, the two defects that are most closely identified as giving Amalek a power over us is number one, coldness in serving Hashem. Meaning even if you're doing mitzvahs, even if you're learning Taira, you do it without enthusiasm, without geschmack, without passion, that gives Amalek power over you. Because Amalek represents detachment from that which is spiritual. And the second aspect, the Achilles heel, if I can use that metaphor of Amalek, is hatred. When we have lack of achdus and lack of unity, which is really hatred among Jews, that makes us vulnerable to the hatred of Amalek. Right, so the two inner Amaleks are Kriris Halev, coldness of the heart and lack of unity. If you look at the first attack of Amalek, mm -hmm. the lesson of the Torah is, Asher Korcha, you were cold. So it's mashma that the first attack came because of the first defect, coldness of the heart. Right, now there are two Achilles heels, but the first attack came because of one chisaren, asher korcha baderech. Now, the second attack came when Aaron died and we lost the clouds of glory. What does Aaron represent? Ohev shalom v'rodev shalom. The death of Aaron spiritually represents a disintegration 
in Achdus and Avas Yisrael. So first attack is Keneged Asher Korcha Baderech. Second attack is Keneged Sina. Purim, which is the third attack, we find both Averis were present. We find lack of Achdus. How do we find this? Because remember, when the Melech says to, I'm sorry, when Haman says to the Melech, there is a nation that is scattered, that has two meanings. Yumen Haman to Yumen Achashverosh is saying, don't worry about the Jews, they're so scattered that they can't really fight you. But there's a higher meaning. Whenever it says Melech, it refers to Melech Malchei Hamlachim HaKadosh Baruch. And Haman is the spiritual power of Haman. That's Amalek. On that level, Mephosa or Mephorad is not referring to geographical dispersion. But it means the Malach of Amalek is saying to Hashem, the Jews don't deserve to be saved because they are divided. They lack unity. That was the Kitrug. That was the Pagam. Right? In other words, that, that is the part of the Megillah that demonstrates the lack of unity in Chal Yisrael. Now, where do you see the other Pagam? The coldness and indifference in Avedah Sashem. Where does that come out in the Megillah? The Gemara says in Abraisa that the Talmidim of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, why did the Jews of that generation deserve to be wiped out? And the first answer he gave, he gave another answer later, is because they enjoyed Achashverosh's banquet. Right? They enjoyed the banquet. They deserved to be destroyed. So Frek the Svas Emes, why is that deserving? I mean, what, what did they do by enjoying the banquet? They ate treif? They drank non-kosher wine? Okay, those are sins. But these are not sins for which you're high of Misa. The generation deserves to get destroyed because they ate treif at a banquet? Says the Svas Emes, this is a Gavaldi Gavor. It doesn't say that they, got, they were worthy of destruction because they ate at the banquet. But they were worthy of destruction because they enjoyed the banquet. Why is that worse? Why did Achashverosh make a banquet in the third year of his reign? Because he, the Gemara goes to a, cal a complicated cheshvan, I'm not going to go into the details, but he calculated that the, he knew the Jews are supposed to be redeemed after 70 years. And he started the count early. He didn't start it from the right point. And based on his erroneous calculation, the 70 years were up. And if the 70 years were up and the Jews were not redeemed, that means either Hashem cannot redeem them or Hashem has changed his mind. And he celebrated the fact that there'll be no base on Mikdash. I mean, he miscalculated, but according to his miscalculation, who needs, there's no base on Mikdash, there's no return to Eretz Yisrael. The Jews are going to remain in Golas. And when it says, the Jews enjoyed the banquet, the Chi of Misa is not the eating or drinking. They rejoiced in what the banquet represented. Who needs Eretz Yisrael? Who needs the Beis Hamikdash? We're happy in the Golas. We're happy with the way things are. We have our glad kosher, uh, wouldn't be a Chinese restaurant, but our glad kosher Persian restaurants. We have our Chal of Yisrael pizza. Again, I'm not sure I have to check gastronomic history when pizza was invented. Uh, whatever it would be. Now, what can be more cold than that? A person doesn't yearn for Geula. He doesn't yearn for Kirvat Elokim. He doesn't yearn for the restoration of prophecy. That is a cold, so even if you're from, that's a coldness of the heart. So it turns out the following. The first war of Amalek attacked our coldness. The second war of Amalek attacked our lack of Avas Yisrael. The third war of Amalek attacked both. Now, this is why, just another minute, this is why 
when we finally are saved from Amalek and we finally celebrate, we have to rectify both Begamim. We have to fix why Amalek was able to get us. We fix the lack of Avas Yisrael by mitzvahs like Sholach Manos, Matanus of Yonim, unity, togetherness, camaraderie. How do we fix the coldness of the heart? Now this is a little less obvious, but you know that one of the important Avedas of Purim is accepting the Torah. Now the Gemara says, what do you mean accepting the Torah? On Shavuos, we were forced into it. The mountain was held over our head. On Purim, after we were saved, we accepted out of love what we had previously accepted out of fear. So Purim is Kabbalah's HaTorah Me'ava. What is the difference between accepting something because you're forced into it and accepting something because you love the Torah and you love Hashem? The answer is the enthusiasm and passion you will bring to the task. If I do it because there's a gun to my head, I will do it. I will do it. But I'm not going to get a joy in doing it. When I do it out of love, everything is a joy. So now it's a beautiful thing. The three encounters of Amalek, encounter one, chisarin one, encounter two, chisarin two, encounter three, both. Purim, we were in jeopardy because of the two pigamim that make us vulnerable to Amalek. And when we are redeemed, we have to fix both of those chisronos. And that is the structure upon which Purim is, is based. So I want to wish you all a Freilich uh, HaPurim, Baruch Hashem, you know, in, uh, in Yerushalayim. We don't go straight from the Tainus to the Megillah reading, so you're able to eat as soon as the fast is over. Our brethren outside of Yerushalayim uh, will have to prolong the fast till after Megillah reading. But the truth is, both days are days of Simcha. Yudalit and Tesvav are days of Simcha, both for people in Yerushalayim and people outside of Yerushalayim. So these are days of Yeshua and Geula. The world right now is in a very, very dangerous uh, place. Not just the Ukraine, but these are tragedies that might spread even worldwide. We need the Yeshua Hashem very, very uh, desperately. But Baruch Hashem, just as Purim was the great day of salvation thousands of years ago, may it also be the day of salvation, even Bizpanesat. So, take care. Amen.